Hi, my name's John and welcome to the ancient city of London, otherwise known as the Square Mile. So secretive, it has its own police force, has its own Lord Mayor, even the Queen of England isn't allowed in without permission. But it's also home to some of the world's finest and most exquisite pubs. So follow me, let's go and take a look. First up, we have the lovely Black Friar. There you see the fat and jolly monk right on the front. The pub itself is 1875, the interior 1905. It means it's arts and crafts, Art Nouveau, created by one of the world's 50 top artists. He used 50 types of marble, mother of pearl inlay, copper and brass relief, all the time remembering the lives of the monks who were living here in the 13th century. The monastery was so wealthy, Henry VIII, when he was divorcing wife number one, Catherine of Aragon, he actually comes and the Vatican messenger prefer prefers to spend time here rather than enjoy the king's hospitality at Hampton Court or the palaces of Westminster. The real joy of this pub, to some it looks like London's flat iron building if you've been to New York, a thin slither of cheese. And we're lucky to have it because the real estate is some of the most expensive in the world. In the 1960s, they wanted to knock this pub down and build something gray, concrete and horrible. If we look over to the left, you'll see what was to replace it. And on a tangent, the buildings you're looking at, that's where Tom Cruise actually broke his leg in the filming of the last Mission Impossible. Leaping from roof to roof, that's where he snapped it and stopped traffic. But coming back to the more beautiful pub, the person who saved the pub, it was our poet laureate, Sir John Betjeman. He was living locally. He heard they wanted to demolish it. He gets a petition. He loved the good boozer, he loved the architecture, and now this grade two listed pub is safe for the nation. We can enjoy it. The more you look, the more you see. Behind the bar, it reads in the in-carved wood, it says tomorrow shall be Friday. In the Catholic Church, it's a day you can't eat meat. So you'll see all the monks, they're going fishing down on the River Thames for their fish and chip Friday to this day. Let's go and have a look. And as you look here, it's all about the class divide in London pubs, not anymore, but it reminds us that not everyone of different social strata could drink in the same place. I'm not dressed very smartly, I don't have a suit and a tie on, so I would not be heading to the saloon bar. I'm gonna head into this public bar here. It's gonna be cheap, cheerful, spit and sawdust. But if I were to dress appropriately, go into the saloon bar in the day, I'm gonna pay a little bit more for my drink, but that's when I get to enjoy all the true splendor this pub has to offer. So here we are in the beautiful Gough Square, a lovely old cobbles, 16th, 17th century house. And as the plaque tells us, this is the former house and home of the one and only Dr. Samuel Johnson. The doctor, it was a honorary title given to him, but what is he famous for? Writing one of the world's first English dictionaries. It predates the Oxford English by about 150 years. He takes nine years traveling the British Isles, writing down the dialect, trying to assimilate the English language of which we use to this day. It's very boring work, but he's well paid for at least three years. But as he gets bored, he would always give us little examples of how to use the word as well as define it. So D, D is for dull. The example to write dictionaries is dull work. And if you're Scottish, he wasn't a fan because O, O is for oats. A grain in England of which we feed to horses appears to support the nation of Scotland. So let's go and see his favorite friend, Hodge the Cat on the far side of the square. And as well as being famous for the dictionary, Dr. Johnson, was a great liberal progressive man. The cat, we'll see Hogg shortly, is a great example. We've just had the plagues of London. We've just had the great fire. Nobody kept cats as a domestic pet. They thought it was vermin of the day, but he was wise. He knew the cat was perfectly safe and Hogg the cat became one of the first domestic pets in London. He also, on another story, had a black manservant called Francis Barber and we'll see the oysters shortly that was cat food in the day the oysters today very expensive but in the 1700s it's like eating a piece of crap it's come from the river thames it's an open sewer it's the worst food you could consume and that's why it's cat food rather than human food but johnson he would go and buy the oysters rather than send francis barber out because it was so demeaning in the day and when johnson dies he leaves his worldly wealth 
to Francis Barber as well. Let's go and say hello to Hodge. See what he's got for us. Even on the far side, you can see the clock, and that is Boswell House, named after the great biographer of Dr. Samuel Johnson. And it's for the biography, as well as the dictionary, it means Johnson is the second most quoted author in the English language after William Shakespeare himself. Not a day goes by when you don't open a paper, listen to the news, and hear a reference point that Johnson has written back. And on the plaque in front of us, probably the most famous quote relevant to London, it says on it, Sir, when a man is tired of London, he is tired of life. But there is in London all that life can afford a man. Let's have a look. So here's the friendly Hodge, just finishing off his lovely oyster for his dinner. And what's he sitting on? nine years work, 45,000 words in here. This is a much of the English language of which we speak to today. And on the front, Hodge, his name, and then there, that famous quote, relevant to the tide of London, tide of life. And although Johnson was a learned man, he went to Pembroke College for a short period of time, he was also a great character, a real boozer, an incredible wit, incredibly eloquent in the pubs and it's the pubs where you would meet, you would greet, you would spend time with the literary wits to feed your dictionary in the day and round the corner it's probably the most famous pub in the whole of London. They say you might have seen the Queen at Buckingham Palace, spent the night in the Savoy Hotel but until you've been for a drink in your old Cheshire Cheese you have not seen the whole of London and with Johnson's house just round the corner it's almost certain who would have whiled away quite a lot of time in the, behind these doors. And even as we come down the laneway, these little lamps, they're still powered by gas. It's still quite light at the moment, so you can't see it. But if you want to see some original lamps in London, go close to the Savoy Hotel on Carting Lane, and still they collect the methane from those fantastic Victorian basil jet sewers to this day burning dimly into the night. So some people think don't come to London in the depths of winter, the snow, the cold, the rain, but nothing could be better than approaching a historic pub, this one dating back originally to the mid 1500s. Approach by candlelight, sit by the fire, have a nice pint of stout and a pork pie to finish it off. It doesn't look like there's a famous pub around here, but it is. And if you're a fan of Charles Dickens, you'll enjoy this one too. There, just as we look down the lane, the old Cheshire cheese. Originally here, mid 1500s, burnt down in that great fire of London, 1666. So the date on it today, 1667. We built with immediate effect. And Charles Dickens, read a tale of two cities. Charles Darnay has been acquitted of high treason at the Central Criminal Court, the Old Bailey. And when he's a free man, he comes down Ludgate Hill, goes through a narrow little archway, and recruits his strength with a simple supper and a few fine wines right here. Seven stories in total, it's a labyrinth, it's a maze. It used to be a whorehouse upstairs, not anymore. And although Dickens was here, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle would pen some Sherlock Holmes novels, Mark Twain, Theodore Roosevelt, Thackeray, even Walt Disney, he popped in and signed the uh, guest book with a little uh, Daffy Duck in the day. It's more a question of people who haven't been to the cheese rather than have. So let's cross that famous threshold and search for one of the most famous parrots, Polly the Parrot, hiding in the front bar. She was here for 40 years, flying around, swearing all and sundry. But when she passes away in 1926, she is so world famous, they record her death in 200 national newspapers from around the world. And that's why Polly the Parrot, she wasn't cremated or buried. She was stuffed and she looks down at us from this day in the bar on our right hand side. So let's go and see where Dickens used to sit. <laughs> Here we are at one of the most famous pubs in London, the old Cheshire Cheese, originally here mid 1500. That's the time when Henry VIII was on the throne. The date on it today, 1667. So we built with immediate effect after the Great Fire of London. It's not the oldest in London, 
but it feels the oldest. And through that doorway, it's more a question of who hasn't been through there than those that have. So Charles Dickens, Arthur Conan Doyle, Mark Twain, Thackeray, Theodore Roosevelt, Walt Disney, they've all been to the Cheshire Cheese for the simple pleasures of no music, sit by the fire. Some of the cheapest drinks in London too, so you can't go wrong with that. So, welcome to the wonderful Church of St Brides, my favourite in the City of London. One of the work, many works that Sir Christopher Wren creates after the Great Fire. But the thing about Sir Christopher Wren, you can tell, he's a great, great architect. But more than that, he's a very good businessman. Why? Because he builds a pub. And the pub that he builds is just on the other side of the church. He builds the Old Bell Tavern so that during the day, he pays his stonemasons a little bit of money to build the church. But at night, he gives them a pub to drink in and he's going to get all that money back. Business school as well as history school in the City of London. We just saw our right, there is the Old Bell Tavern, a pub linked to Sir Christopher Wren, our greatest architect of the 17th century in many ways. It's a simple pub though, it's not grand like the Blackfriars because it was a simple pub designed for his workmen, but it's humble charms. You can see the master plan for the city of London after the Great Fire, and London could easily have looked more like Paris or Rome or Berlin with grand boulevards, but after 10 years, nobody would ever sell the property to each other. So after 10 years, we end up with these silly, and ancient, impractical, medieval route ways to this day. Welcome to this quiet City of London back street. Look how narrow it is, just wide enough for one horse and one cart to clip clop its way around the corner. When we have visitors from Holland or Denmark come and visit with us, they always say, John, the thing we love about London so much is just how wide your cycle lanes are. But this is our medieval street plan. This is what London was like before the great fire. And never forget, the architecture was different as well. For each story of the building would go up, it would come out, up and out. They would almost touch at the top, making a tunnel. You could shake hands with your neighbour in the morning over breakfast. But of course, that's why the Great Fire of London in 1666 would leap from roof to roof, absolutely unstoppable. So after 1666, straight-sided buildings only. If you're looking for the oldest buildings in the city of London, look for the ones that steal into thin air. The other thing you should look out for, City of London bollards, the red and the white shows us we are in the square mile. Also, if you're from France, maybe you won't enjoy them because it reminds me of when we used to beat the French a lot at naval warfare. Sometimes we'd steal their ships, steal their cannons. Their cannons would not fit our warships. So rather than melt them down, Londoners place them vertically on street corners and they protect the pedestrians from horses and carriages mounting the pavement. But the design becomes so well known, so popular, that modern bollards like this one, with a cannonball fused in the muzzle, are designed on those from over 200 years ago. So when you visit London, just remember that wherever you look, it says, we beat the French. Let's go and have a look at the old Bank of England. Not built as a pub, originally 1888, but it's magnificent banking hall until the 1970s. The bank vaults, they stored the crown jewels. The clocks in the pub stopped the last moment a financial transaction ever took place. And although the pub and the drinks are spectacular, we always say never ever eat the pies. And that's because it lies on Bell Yard. It's Fleet Street, famous for the demon barber. I need a little shave myself. I pop in for the shave, sit on the chair, close my eyes, but then that trap door is going to flip me over. Sweeney Todd is going to come down the stairs if I haven't broken my neck, finish me off with a cutthroat razor, chop my body into tiny pieces and send me here to Bell Yard where Mrs. Lovett had her lair. I'm served in these meat pies to the unknowing public of London. They travel for miles around because nobody could replicate that unique and tangy flavour. If you ask what the recipe was, you would go in the pies to hide the evidence. So the pub, the drinks is gorgeous. Maybe just don't eat too many of the pies. Let's go and have a look at 1888 Grand Architecture. Grandiose, it looks like we've gone to Florence. The chandeliers are winched down, they're so spectacular. 
Even the manager, he had a 20, 25 room apartment in the day when it first opened. And now we can just pop in for a humble, warm of glass of beer or a nice uh, pint of something colder along the way. So let's cross the road and go and see what the locals are up to. Try and hear the gossip from the high courts that happened today. That's nice. Quite young.